me, like like you say, when you say potluck, we don't have potlucks anymore. What we have are people who go and buy pre pre made food at a store <laughs> and bring it as if they made it, right? So like when you when you talk about uh, Betty Crocker, people didn't want people didn't want to buy the the Betty Crocker cookbook because it involved everything that was pre made, and people thought, well. Why would I want to do that? I, I need to make it myself. Mm. So what they did was they changed the they changed the recipes slightly, so that you would be you would just like beat the eggs into the flour mixture. So it made you feel like you were actually making it. Oh, like the shake and bake and the ready like yes. the cake mixes and all that. It's like so it's like a par cook. It's like, like yeah. yeah. It's it, it gives you this this feeling like you actually participated in creating this food. Really, you did almost nothing. That is a fucking episode right there. That's like we're doing it, uh, like our entitlement and our yeah. did all that. You know, like potluck dinner table. You or? know, I, I would. So one of my friends back home got diagnosed with severe diabetes. I worked with him, and his question is like, "Well, I, I don't get it. Like we're designed to eat meat." And I looked at him, and I'm like, "I go when you can leap from a tree, <laughs> chase down the gazelle, jump on its back, and take him down." And then bite through its pelt, <laughs> then you can call yourself a fucking meat eater. <laughs> like, until you can do that, because your your ass can't even People get can't off even... the couch right now, let alone chase down an animal and, and and then like you said, skin it, fabricate it, cook it, right? That's Store hard. it, freeze it. Yeah. Right. What are you gonna do with all the organ meats? What are, what are you gonna do with that? You know. Well, some people would just. Some, I mean, some people don't even know that that is part of the animal because right, it comes. In the freezer section, pre-packaged yes. for you. Yeah. Nice and pretty and pink. All right. Well, that's good because uh, everything revolves around breaking bread together, like that theme, whatever that is. And then what is it? Yeah. Okay. That's a great topic. So right. Call this that episode. Leave the bread alone. Break something else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Uh, oh, I say it. I say it again. You've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. Bamboozled. You've been had, and what makes matters worse is you're allowing it. A lifetime of nutritional deception has forced us into the fight for our lives. We are the plant-based riot. We are here to tear down the curtain of secrecy created by our very own American food industry. A plant-based diet and a disease-free life are not out of reach. Make the choice. Today's episode is sponsored by Triad Resolution. Triad Resolution is a plant-based consulting firm. Whether you are a high-performance athlete, an individual living with diabetes, or a parent looking to change your household dietary habits radically, Triad will train, educate, and empower you to meet your intended goals and live a healthier life. You can find Triad Consulting on Facebook at Brian Triad. Give Dr. Brian K. Blackburn, PhD, a shout at brian.triadresolutions at gmail.com. Do you have the Triad Resolve? We want to thank Whisper Farms. Whisper Farms is a co-op of backyard farms and gardens providing greens and fruits available at the Atwater Village Farmer's Market. Come check them out. Tenderst in town. Talk to me. What do you got going on at the Farmer's Market this this weekend? Anything protein packed? I have watercress. And so watercress is an aquatic vegetable that's very high in protein, as well as many minerals and vitamins. And uh, it's spicy. It's crunchy. It has an edible stem that is water filled right so it's it's a refreshing spicy way to boost the nutrition of your salads wow water based it's It's yeah it's an aquatic vegetable so it grows it grows in a sort of a river that i have created in my backyard wow right it needs running water to grow um and uh it's got this crunchy stem because the stem is hollow and it it will um it will pull water into it um and and so it's it's got to be one of the most nutritious vegetables out there. Um, one of the reasons has to do with its spiciness. So it's it's got that heat to it, and you get that heat because of the uh, the spicy sugars that it has, and those are really good at cleansing the body. Wow, got, you got yeah. anything else? All right, I'm I'm down. You got anything else uh, to to kind of cool you down from the from the spicy crispness of the watercress? Yes, so uh, some some nice. Uh, 
cold bruschetta on some toasted olive oil toasted bread. So I'm, I'm bringing tomatoes and Genovese basil, freshly cut. There's nothing better than, than freshly sliced basil and um, get that going with some gar- garlic and uh, tomatoes. Wow. So, well, you heard it. Tenderson Town, <laughs> Farmer Mike, Whisper Farms. Come check them out at Water Village Farmers Markets on Sundays. Mike, when are you normally setting up your booth on Sundays? When when can customers? When are the, the market officially get there? starts at ten a.m. But okay. you can you can come as early as eight a.m. Oh, you're there that early. It will not turn you away. Wow. Yeah. So so you're there essentially from eight to two or something like that. Eight to two. Yeah. Nice. All right. We are the Plant Based Riot, a weekly commutable length, forty five minute or so, evidence based call to action conversation about living a healthy and disease-free life. I'm Dan, husband, father of three, who's trying to raise a plant-based whole food household for the past two and a half years. I'm a local 600 director of photography uh, out here in Los Angeles for the television and motion picture industry. You can find me on Facebook at Daniel Farnham and on Instagram at Daniel.Farnham. I'm Brian. I'm a PhD and a metabolic scientist. Uh, I specialize in diabetic research. I'm a 23-year plant slayer, and I unapologetically eat gluten. I'm Mike, and I'm a small man, stay-at-home dad. I'm a water gardener slash soil builder. I am a market gardener, and I am a vegetable vendor, and I'm a locavore. In today's episode, plant-based protein. The greatest story never told. In this show, we are synthesizing and degrading the myths and facts about protein and a plant-based lifestyle. You hear this every day. I need to eat animal protein because I don't want to be weak. Is that true? You're right. We, we actually hear it quite a bit. Um, and there's no truth to that whatsoever. If you're trying to gain strength, you need to get your ass into the weight room. Uh, the consumption of protein is going to have nothing to do with increases in strength, increases in power, increases in, in endurance. Um, metabolically, we only use about 5 to 7% of total protein-based calories to provide metabolic energy. So get in the gym, get or a regiment, <laughs> get a personal trainer, and make it happen. And what was that, Mike? Get in the garden as well. <laughs> get in the garden, right. Yeah. Start pumping, uh, what's, what's that feed that we use? The Jacks? Jacks feed. Oh. Get jacked with Jacks. <laughs> Get jacked with Jacks. <laughs> I love it. Brought yeah. to you by Jacks. Uh, yeah, you want to get strong, pick up a shovel. Start s- digging. Several shovels. Yeah. I don't know if a shovel is going to really build strength. I mean, I mean shoveling. Start shoveling, shoveling right, dirt. Right, there you go. You know? huh, great, I can dig that. All right, how about this? Is our country eating enough protein? Being plant-based, are you missing out on your said daily, you know, values of protein, whether it's meat or plant? Okay, let me answer that two-part question with a two-part response. I love that. All right, so the first thing you asked is, are we getting enough protein in this country? We are getting an excessive amount of protein in this country. So for some reason, America has this very intimate relationship with protein especially recently, over the past five, six years, protein has been put into everything. Second part of your question is, if I'm on a plant-based diet, can I still get the daily recommended allowance of protein? Absolutely, 100%. You certainly can. All right. Well, first of all, let me throw this your guys' way. How much protein do we actually need on a daily basis? So the daily recommended allowance that's suggested by most nutritional organizations suggests that we get 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. So, so what does that mean? So essentially that means if you are 150 pounds and we convert that to kilograms, that then makes you 68 kilograms. So if we multiply 0.8 grams by 68 kilograms, we get 54.4 grams. And what that means essentially is a person who weighs 150 pounds basically needs 217 calories from protein in order to get their daily recommended allowance. When you talk about people with protein deficiencies in developing countries, the first proposed solution is a plant-based source of protein because that makes the most sense. 
see when you when you try to figure out how can I get protein, you know, um, a rural developing country may not have the infrastructure to be raising animals the way we do here. They don't have subsidized ag chemicals to produce grains cheaply like we do with corn. They don't have an industrial agriculture to produce corn in great amounts. They don't have elect like an electrical grid to build huge factory farms to raise animals in confinement. And and really if you wanted to think about a solution in a developing country, why would you even why would you even go there? Uh, a plant-based protein is so much more efficient, so much faster, so much easier, um, and makes the most sense. Oh, I say it, I say it again, you've been had. Okay, gentlemen, dumb this down for me. What is protein, and specifically, what does a plant do to make protein versus what do animals do to make protein? What's the difference? So animals and plants uh, synthesize protein in similar ways. So from what I know, plants take in nitrogen, which is a mineral, from water and soil into the roots of the plant, and then nitrogen, uh, also known as amino acids, are synthesized into proteins within ribosomes, within plant cells. Okay, so then, all right, that's how plants make protein. And right. then, so Brian, what do you know about how animals make protein? So if you're referring to us as an animal, is that sure. what you're referring okay, to? Yeah. Okay. Or animals that we humans would um, eat. I'm not up to speed on how a cow creates a protein, um, but we essentially create proteins by ingesting the uh, proteins that were made by the plants. So essentially, um, where we get our protein from, which is basically a, a protein is a the only nitrogen-containing macronutrient that we get in through our diet. And that nitrogen piece is really, really important. And we'll talk about that later. Um, but the reason we consume the plants or consume any food is to basically obtain those proteins. But more specifically, the amino acids that um, are linked together within that protein that we want to basically disassemble and we want to get those amino acids into the bloodstream and into the liver. So essentially what happens is when we break down food. So the, regard the food, like regard if it's animal protein or plant protein, you're talking how our body, what is our body, tra- how does our body translate yeah, that into so, our own protein that we need to take in? So okay. essentially there's not much difference between how the body breaks down uh, either sources of protein. Okay. The only difference is that uh, animal protein does have more bioavailability of amino acids than plants, okay. which is why if you're on a plant-based diet, it's recommended that you eat more frequently. So you eat your proteins, you eat foods high in protein more frequently. What's that, Mike? So, you know, talking about protein and plants, um, I know from experience that uh, if you want more protein in your vegetables, you need to make sure they have enough nitrogen, right? So. There's actually a linear, a linear relationship between the amount of nitrogen that a plant takes in and the amount of protein it can produce. Mm. So, so there's like a healthy soils positive correlation create, between those. Right. So if you want more protein in your vegetables, in your beans, in your um, even in the leaves, in the leaves of plants such as kale or watercress or even lettuce, you'll have a higher protein kale if it's if it's in very rich soil. Hmm. But, but what if, if you're if growing it like uh, hydroponically or aquaponically? In a hydroponic system, those are often tightly controlled. So the minerals that plants need are spoon-fed to the plant, um, often at levels that um, might be difficult to get in soils. Really? Okay, so, so it's more efficient in, with the water. Yeah, that's oftentimes why uh, hydroponically grown leafy greens um, not only have way more flavor but we'll test for higher levels of minerals and protein and vitamins because they're able to, they're basically able to produce a lot more because they have all the oh, the raw materials they need in abundance. All right, so uh, you, with Whisper Farms, you do, sidebar here, everybody, real quick, go with me on this. You do food forestry, fruit forestry, you do uh, wicking beds, hydro and aquaponic and microgreen growing, right? On your That's right. And sprouts as well. All right, we're going to have to talk about this someday. I'm I'm still learning all the different things that all the different techniques of of gardening, but so so you're saying in water, water beds, 
that right. you can grow vegetables in without soil. That's right. These See, think about vegetables are going to taste better than soil-based ones. In my experience, when you're talking about leafy vegetables. Right, because you grow yes. it and sell it, so you know. Wow. Yeah. Interesting thing about water and minerals is that how do minerals get into plants? Water takes them into the root, right? Whether you're in soil or whether you're in water, minerals tumbling around in water go into the root. That's how they get in. Wow. All right, so I'm bringing this back. Um, the question was, how much protein do we need on a daily basis? You answered that for us a second ago, Brian. Um, and then now you're saying, Mike, that, um, or both of you guys kind of said, the protein that we're taking in, whether it be from animals or plants, we just probably need to eat a little bit more of leafy greens to get our, and fruits and vegetables in, in to get our protein levels um, right. into our body. So basically, uh, what did you say? We're, we're, we're getting enough protein by lunch. And maybe if you're eating plants and vegetables, we just need to eat a little bit more. So maybe by late lunch, early dinner, we're, we've hit our uh, vegetable intake. Wow. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, dumb this down for me. Um, Brian, what is protein? So a protein is the only nitrogen-based macronutrient that we get from food and use in our body. Got it. Okay. All right. So my bad. Specifically, what I'm asking is... Um, what does what does our body do with protein that comes from an animal versus what does our body do with protein that comes from a plant? So essentially, there's no difference in the source of protein. Uh, the body's going to break it down the exact same way. The only difference is that an animal-based protein is going to have more bioavailability of amino acids, which means bioavailability, which, which means the absorption faster. the absorption of the amino acids from that protein are going to be more efficient. So is that bad for plants then? It's not bad for plants. It just essentially means that we have to eat more plants throughout the day and that's not a bad thing. So you're getting more than just protein from plants. You're getting it's a, a lot lot more. Yeah, when you get when you're eating plants, it's kind of like a buy one get seven free sort of deal where you're just getting a tremendous amount of bang for your for your buck and a lot less drawback. A lot less uh, hidden adverse things associated with it. So yes. Very good, Mike. I'm going to hit you with this one because I know you grow a lot of these vegetables and you bring it to market and everything. Your, your whole yes. farm garden looks amazing. It looks like a photo shoot in any corner. You can just point a camera anywhere. It's so beautiful back there. Well, the question is, you got it. question is, uh, we, we should be doing a podcast back there. We're close, I know, but we should be doing that back there someday. The question is, what uh, plants that you bring to market are high in protein? Or or in general, what plants should we be should be on our radar if we're looking to get our daily value of plants protein? Plant well, protein. I would say some of the, the highest protein plants that I know of would be beans, nuts, and seeds. However, I specialize in growing leafy vegetables. And you. Tenders in town. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, you know, that can't be overlooked. You know, um, to, to talk about uh, how much protein is in a leafy vegetable, such as kale or spinach or even lettuce, watercress, Swiss chard. People don't generally think of these as protein sources. However, um, when they're grown in very rich soil, which contains nitrogen, those that that nitrogen goes into the leaf tissue and is turned into proteins. So the soil or or um, vitamins and minerals that a plant is getting, whether in soil or water, is all dependent on the nitrogen level in that the they soil. Get. Does that make yeah. does that right? So the more nitrogen that a plant gets, within reason, you know, too much nitrogen can burn a plant. But um, higher levels of nitrogen will produce higher levels of protein. Ah, okay. And so if you have a leaf of kale, it may have something like 2 grams of protein in 100 grams of kale leaves. If you were to dehydrate that kale leaf into a powder, then by removing almost 100% of that water, that 2 grams can become 20% protein, which is significant. Interesting. That's yeah. cool. So, so you're concentrating it by removing the water. That's right. Yeah. So that's the reason why there's only two grams. Yeah. It's because you're you're eating a lot of water as well, but you're also getting, you know, almost 100 percent of your daily value for vitamin A, C, and K for your eye health, skin health, bone health, phytonutrients, antioxidants. You're getting a whole complete package um, in addition to fiber. All right. Well, you guys put your heads together here, real quick. Who's got some numbers on? I want to know. I want to know hard facts on protein packed plants. Like, what do you have any numbers? Have you guys ever read anything about like 
I know you guys deal with this a lot. Yeah. So I think the biggest hurdle most people have with trying to adopt a plant-based diet and obtaining their protein from that is everyone's afraid that they're not getting complete proteins, right? right. So you probably have people that come to tr- come to you for the triad yeah, yeah, consulting that, that you have to advise. They're the always on. like, you know, how am I gonna how am I gonna gain weight and build muscle and you know increase my performance when I'm not getting these essential amino acids? So, you know, just a quick recap without getting into a biochemistry lesson is, you know, the reason we eat proteins and the reason we we masticate it in our mouth and we have these, you know, uh, digestive enzymes and these chemical. Um, processes that break down the protein is we, we want to break down the peptide bonds that are holding the amino acids together. And that way those amino acids can get into the small intestines and then be absorbed into the bloodstream and then be utilized by the body. So the biggest hurdle that most people have is they're worried that they're not getting the essential amino acids. Okay. And those are the ones that essentially the body can't create on its own. So you have to get it exogenously from, from plants. But my, my response to that is a lot of these plants have the essential amino acids. So, you know, specifically the branch chain amino acids, that's the ones that everyone's worried about. And those are the amino acids that go to the liver, kind of gets packaged and then sent to skeletal muscle to help muscle grow, help muscle repair um, in times of protein deficit or in times of uh, protein synthesis, the, the muscle can then send those branch chain amino acids to other tissues. So, um, you know, when people talk about those specific amino acids, they're like, well, they're not in plants. They are. They're just not packaged in a single unit like they are in animals. So how do we get it if we're eating? So how do, you, how do you get it? So if you're looking at like isoleucine, leucine, and valine, right, the branch chain amino acids, yeah, no single plant contains all of those. But if you overlap your right, diet, variety, right? right, you overlap your, di- your diet with a variety of plants, you could essentially obtain all of those by, you know, eating soy, as Mike mentioned earlier, eating watercress, uh, sunflower seed oil, um, sunflower seed um, butter, um, alfalfa seeds, things like this. They, they all have those essential amino acids. So you can get them in by increasing the variety of plants. And our body can use that the way it wants to. It's going to use it the same way it's going to use the um, essential amino acids that you obtain from animals. So essentially... The process of breaking down the proteins is the same. Okay, your body is going to break down the protein to get at those amino acids. That's what it wants. When it obtains those amino acids and it gets into the blood, gets into the liver, it gets sent to where it needs to go, the excess amino acids are going to be removed or degraded. Um, so yeah, and on top of that, we we pool certain amino acids. The body kind of retains a, a pool of them. So in times of need, if protein synthesis needs to happen, it will grab those amino acids and start creating the necessary proteins that the body requires. Wow. It seems complicated, but after hearing it broken down step by step, it's, it's cool. It's, it's so it's still the thing ringing in the back of my head is like, you know, you, you have these conversations about, oh, I eat plants, I'm, I'm plant-based, uh, vegan, vegetarian, whatever it is. And then, and then you're, you're talking to, you know, your, your buddies are, you know, grabbing a beer around the barbecue grill and these conversations come up and it's like, like you got to be big, you got to eat meat. Like just there's no, that's that's that bumper sticker, right? You yeah. don't understand like all just get educated and w- aware of this. Stuff. And for that mentality, let me let me give you some evidence. You wanted hard numbers, I'm going to give you hard numbers. All right. So the World Health Organization they put out reports all the time on what plants have, what amino acids, and how to obtain a a healthy diet through just eating plants. Um, if you look at isoleucine, um, the World Health Organization says if you're 121 pounds you require uh, 1,110 milligrams of isoleucine to maintain health. Right. So if you look at soy protein, one serving of soy protein has 2,650 milligrams. Twice as much. Twice as much. Wow. And if you compare that to egg whites, which is what most weightlifters eat, right? They they want to get huge. They want to get those gains. Um, It has just as much. So egg whites have 2,754 milligrams of the isoleucine. So soy and egg whites are essentially the same value. Interesting. So, um, hmm. you know, the, the information is out there. The information is out there to um, live a healthy diet by eating plant-based protein. You just you just have to look. Yeah, I'm glad you guys are talking about this. You, this can't, you can't accept the, you know, the fact that if you want to be strong, if you want to be healthy, if you want to, you know, 
have a healthy lifestyle, you have to eat animal based protein. Yeah. Because it's completely fictitious. That's cool. Yeah. This is great. Cool, guys. All right. So I got another one for you guys. Now that we're on a roll here. Um, How does our body use protein? What does our body what does our body do with the protein that we ingest? Okay, so um, your body is going to, as I said, break down the amino acids, create a pool of those amino acids, and then when there is a need, that being the key word, when there is a need, it will synthesize new proteins and use those amino acids to do so. Okay. So, um, you know, what we, I mean, proteins and everything, right? Imagine going to the beach, sitting on the beach for 30 minutes, and then getting in your car and going home, and that, that those granules of sand just being in every crevice of your body for the next day, right? Oh. So protein is like, it's it's everywhere in the body. Okay. It, it, is, it is a major structural component of almost everything in the body. So, um, you know, we take these amino acids and we will create enzymes. We will create hormones. What, so for the enzymes, what does our body use for the enzymes are used? So metabolically, the enzymes are going to make reactions occur, like biochemical reactions, like whether it's anabolic or catabolic or, um, you know, any sort of biological process that occurs in the body that requires signaling, an enzyme is going to assist that and catalyze a reaction. Got it. So the protein is the energy for those enzymes? The protein is the enzyme, uh, right? So it's, it's, it, is the, it is what makes the enzyme. Great. Right? Yep. Um, your collagen, your tendons, your blood vessels, your bones, your skeletal muscle, um, albumin that's in your blood, lipoproteins, um, all these things that help um, the body function is made of protein. Hmm. Yeah. All right. That's kind of cool. That's good. So bodies everywhere. Uh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, protein is everywhere. Dead bodies everywhere. Dead bodies everywhere. Love that what song. Zombie, zombie <laughs> fan. Okay. Um, <laughs> is it true that if you're grilling meat, and the fat that's burned off, that drips down. I used to, I was hardcore into the whole grilling world. Smoke, offset smoker box, the whole deal of uh, pecan wood, peach wood, apple wood. It doesn't get better than this, right? Um, which I do, actually, I do need to learn how to start grilling vegetables. I, it's an art. I haven't, I honestly, I, I go back, I went back to the gas, I feel so bad. I went for the gas grill. All my friends are going to hate me for this. I went to the gas grill and doing corn on the cob. It's just like, oh, this, I'm missing it just doesn't feel like the same thing. All right, so the question is, uh, back into this, um, is, is it carcinogenic? Is the is the fat that's burning off of meat coming down onto the hot goals? Is it, can it be carcinogenic? Is it bad? Is it, is, is I'm, I'm not trying to, definitely it feels like I'm shaming my grilling past or, or barbecuing in general, but I know it's different if you do an offset smoker box and you're smoking at lower temperatures, but if you're just grilling the normal, just get out the gas grill, grill on that or something, is that bad if that burns or is that not really a thing? Or um, I've never heard of the association of grilling with the fat being carcinogenic. The hatch marks that you create while grilling are carcinogenic have been reported to be carcinogenic. Is there, there's a term for that. Uh, was it the myriad reaction? Or? The, yeah, the Maillard reaction. Maillard yeah, reaction? Ma- yeah. What is um, that? Is that? So that is uh, with the, the application of intense heat. Um, you basically have um, glycation occurring. So you have proteins kind of non-enzymatically fusing with glucose. Um, yeah. That's why, like, when you char your meat, it kind of gives it a sweetness. Yeah, like a exactly. Caramelization. Yeah. Um, so, more importantly, um, that's that particular process develops something that we know as advanced glycation end products. Um, so, when you have the development of advanced glycation end products, also we call them glycotoxins, um, that gets into the body and they bind uh, with these receptors called receptors for advanced glycation end products. And that's a pro-inflammatory and pro-oxidative signaling um, receptor. So essentially, the more of this stuff you eat and the more of these glycotoxins that get in your blood, the more the advanced glycation end products can bind to these receptors and essentially upregulate all these horrible inflammatory pathways. So wait, are you saying all the my my fancy brisket burnt end pieces and chunks? I shouldn't be eating that. Yeah, and if what? you're if you're putting that was the best if part. you're putting barbecue sauce on that, you're you're 
tripling the content of advanced glycation in products because that you know, oh, barbecue more sauce sugar is, is burning. M- more sugar is oh. burning and caramelizing more that the Maillard reaction is occurring. So, uh, yeah. So um, oh, there are like, there kind of like when you if you saute onions in butter, yeah. you get a similar reaction. Yeah, more so at higher temperatures. So your your body creates these glycotoxins endogenously, right? It's just a natural part of metabolism. Natural, we call it a natural byproduct of metabolism. Um, but when you consume them through your diet, just like the amino acids, these advanced glycation end products, they pool and you, you start to enlarge this pool in your body. Um, and, you know, the more you have, the more they signal. And most interestingly is the more the advanced glycation end products signal through the rage receptor, um, the more upregulation of the rage receptor we see. So it's like this horrible feedback where the glycotoxin binds to the receptor, the receptor activates inflammation, it upregulates um, uh, free radical production, right? So make sure you're eating your um, antioxidants. Um, Leafy greens. Yep. Boom. And then um, that process upregulates more of the receptor. So basically the the ligand binding to the receptor feeds more of the the receptor on the membrane of the cell. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Huh. All right. Well, if I... <laughs> So watch how I, you're peeling all my uh, weekend uh, warrior yeah, projects. Be bro. careful of the charring, man. That that'll, that'll I had no get idea. you. Yeah. Like even the burgers, like everything. That's yeah. a, I never. I never like when I was eating meat. I don't eat meat, but when I was eating meat, it was always like the the. I didn't like things raw. Like I wasn't mm-hmm. undercooked. Yeah. I was always like get a little get a little bit of crust down there, you know. And that's why they say like if you know if you want to really kind of reduce your intake of those glycotoxins, you need to poach or boil your food rather than a really high temperature sear or a really high temperature grill. So you want to try to avoid those hatch marks. Damn, mm. you plant-based people are yeah. killing me on yeah. all my fun, cool food I used to eat. Yeah. Well, but what do we know? I hear, you, you know, know we'll what? Just, we'll just... It seems like if, if you're going to if you're gonna be grilling your food like that, you better be eating your greens, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's awesome. Because... <laughs> well, here, let me throw this in, if, if I may. How do I, how do I transition? How do I keep what's cool about being at the grill? You're with friends... You know, you got a beer, or cold glass of iced tea, and you're hanging out, right? It's a, it's a cool. You're out of the kitchen. You're in your own little man space, right? Or whatever it is, woman space too. She shed, right? We just built one of those. Um, nice. My wife does not like that term. I don't know why. Anyways, so what? What do you give me the quick one, two, three of like grilling? Do you guys grill your vegetables? Like, what do you what do you do? How long is too long? Does it char? Can a vegetable char? Is it bad to eat char off a vegetable? Yeah, you know, vegetables contain natural sugars, correct? Right. Right. So, you know, if you have a high heat application and there is a, a level of sugar in there and you start to get that charring. Can you get ill from that? Um, from the plant so, char? I mean, generally, you know, if you look at the, you know, the, the composition of age products, right, the advanced glycation and products, if you look at the composition of those naturally occurring in food, you'll see that you know, meat and cheese and milk and things like that just have a higher level of it, right? Where plants, um, to be honest, I don't, Doesn't exist. I don't even, even know if it exists. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm sure no it kidding. does. Um, but yeah, like, you know, even like the aging process, like, you know, if you you consume like Parmigiano Reggiano, like the longer it ages, the more age products form. So, mm. wow. Yeah. That's kind of cool. See, I love to I love to heat up my corn tortillas on the stove. Okay, you ever tr- you ever try that? Yeah, yeah, in a so frying like, pan or whatever. No, no, I'll just actually right on the I'll pilot. Just put, oh. put the tortilla right on the, the it, stove, and it burns, and, then and it, the whole house have, smells. Have the fire, you know, singe it a little bit. Okay, on both sides of your All tortilla right. just to heat them up, but it adds this nice sweetness, this a little bit of sweet char to your tortilla. Okay, so is that bad for me if I did that or what? Is that going to have the same effect as burning meat? Uh, I mean. It's the same. It sounds like the same process. <laughs> the you're, amount of glycotoxins you're going to get from a piece of tortilla. You need the glycotoxins <laughs> to do that. The glycotoxins are are developing with that charring process. I see. Right. So if the glycotoxins aren't there, then it's just you're just burning it or toasting it. Hmm. Right. Like you're if you're just heating it up rather than charring it, I got you're going to develop less of them. Right. The vegetables will have completely burned by the time you get char on vegetables. Right. Essentially. Potentially. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> just trying to be as as candid as I can 
if a plant contains sugar, you you essentially can have the same reaction occur. Oh, okay. Wow. We're going to have to deep dive on that someday. Mm-hmm. Um, so as you guys know, I'm a cameraman, and these cameras are big and heavy, and sometimes we're doing long takes, and sometimes we're running all over the world and jumping out of things and going under things and all this kind of – wherever the story takes us sometimes. Uh, I noticed I, – I lost over the over the past two and a half years, just I lost 30 pounds on, on focusing on what I'm doing, focusing on what I'm eating, not eating late, and it came down to the beer and chips for me, which those are very tough. I love my beer and chips. But anyways, so I'm moving around. I'm active. I'm moving around a lot. One thing I noticed is my feet stopped hurting. Maybe it's because I was carrying an extra 30 pounds. I don't know. My, my, my feet stopped hurting me. Not I wasn't in pain, but it wasn't like, oh, I got to put my feet up at the end of the night. And my yeah, back no, stopped no hurting. Achiness. So I don't know if these are losing weight or not. But what I'm trying to get at is, is I'm still plant-based and I'm still out and mobile and moving. And ne- like if I sit down, it's at the end of the, it's in my car on the way home. That's where I sit down, which is probably not good for my body. And I, you carry a camera that's designed to be on your right shoulder. So your whole back is all tweaked out. So deep tissue massage. If we have any deep tissue uh, oh. masseuses out there, we are yeah. looking for uh, some sponsors here on the show. Anyway. So the question is, uh, I'm, I'm physical, right? There's, there's people out there that, that, are not plant based. That uh, oh, I can't eat plant. I can't be. I can't be a vegetarian. I can't be vegan because I'm I'm physical and I'm I'm doing a utility or I'm doing a, a big. I have to perform tasks during the day. Is that? Uh, do you guys ever come across that in, in what you guys uh, in, in your conversations with with other people out there? And and if so, what do you say? What, what do you say to people that are are maybe not considering, but say, hey, forget it, man. I'm I'm not sitting behind a desk all day. I can't be vegetarian or I can't be vegan or I can't be plant based. Is is that a thing? Is that a can that be? Can you can you be physical and do that? Is there any examples of people doing huge things that are uh, that are plant based? Yeah. So, um, you know, the your protein consumption really has nothing to do with how physical you are. So, you know, protein is not an energy yielding macronutrient. Like you know, I, I think the research says we get about five to seven percent. Uh, of our energy from protein, right? Which is, which is hardly anything. Wow. Um, so to answer your question, yes, you can eat plants and be energetic. Uh, it it really depends on the type of work you're doing, right? Sure. If you're doing backflips out of cars with a camera attached to you and you're, you know, doing army crawls across the hot, California concrete because you're trying to get a unique Sam Raimi angle with your camera, nice. right? Yeah. Um, those are basically glycolytic pathways that are supplying the energy for that movement. Sure. Right? So you're really not metabolizing protein to, to make that happen. Um, uh. You know, if you want to talk about like, you, you know, can you be, uh, you know, can you perform on yeah. plants, you know, like, look at Kendrick Ferris. Do you guys know who that is? No. no. So Kendrick Ferris is a vegan Olympian that won the gold medal in Brazil for weightlifting. Was he a vegan when he did that? He's, yeah. He's, he, yeah, absolutely. I mean, he went against the world and destroyed everybody in an event where the general population believes they have to have egg whites or whey protein or casein protein to help increase muscle, wow. thereby increasing strength. So, uh, there, I don't know what other evidence. And people you know need. this, right? People, or, or is it? Let's th- um, do people, I didn't know that. But. I, I think I don't know if people know he's a vegan, and if they are, they probably you know tune it out because that has a negative connotation. Sure, you know, of like oh, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, protein is not going to give you the energy to perform. It's going to give you the. The, that's what you th- that's what I think of protein though right that's what everyone I, thinks of protein and that's that's uh, that's what the food industry tells us yeah, you that's know, where like, we get that from yeah I mean if you look you go look at any advertisement on any product in any store it says protein enriched high protein energy producing protein right, so, so it's completely misleading to the consumer pull it's, back that curtain further w- yeah. where do we get our energy from that allows us to perform it depends on the performance if you're a runner right you're doing um, continuous exercising, that's all fatty acid metabolism. That's beta oxidation. That's how you're creating ATP and the energy you need for running through mobilizing fat, right? Protein's mm-hmm. not doing anything. 
if you're a weightlifter and you're, you know, benching 350, Mike, I know you can put up 350. Boom. For a small man, I know you can put it up. <laughs> you know, that's 10 seconds of work. That's 10 seconds of contracting. So you're not, you're in the phosphocreatine pathway. You're not, you're not even, you're not even in anaerobic glycolysis. If you're playing basketball, that might be a combination of anaerobic glycolysis and aerobic glycolysis and maybe a little bit of fatty acid oxidation. But notice the common theme here is that protein's not involved in any of that. That's crazy. When you're done exercising and you go home and you eat and your muscles need to be repaired from the activity that you just did, right. that's when the protein's going to come in and help rebuild and repair and fix you know, whatever damage you uh, have induced in the soft tissue through that exercise. So basically if people are, are going out and consuming huge amounts of protein, but they're not doing, they're not performing or their, their lifestyle doesn't require them to be, to be rebuilding yeah. what's, what the protein is there for. What's all the protein doing? It's being degraded and it's, it, the body's trying to get rid of it as quickly as it can because it's a nitrogen based macronutrient, which means that nitrogen head, that amine group is toxic to the body. It, it could also be being converted into fat. It could be converted really? into glycogen. Absolutely, yes. The body will figure out a way to convert it or Whoa. get rid of it. So you know, when when that nitrogen head is removed and the amino acids are freed up, that nitrogen is toxic to the body. So if I'm not working out, or if I'm not doing something, and I consume high amounts of protein, like yeah. like you're 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 I'm doing getting a, bigger. I'm getting fatter. You're you're doing something. You're not getting the results you want, but yes, Whoa. potentially you can be gaining weight from it. <laughs> potentially you can be, um, you know, storing excess amount of sugar in the liver and wow. in the muscle, mm -hmm. right? Unneeded, unnecessary. Um, you have, uh, you'll have ammonia, you know, floating around in the body that will be converted into urea. Um, and then the urea will be released through the urine and you're, you're basically trying to get rid of that toxic part of protein. What do you think, Mike? You know, when you talk about uh, how protein allows you to build mass, you know, allows you to gain weight, mm -hmm. it's making me think about, you know, uh, raising chickens and quail. I've done this for about eight years, and the thing that always comes up every time when you're buying chicken feed or quail feed, or if you're raising turkeys, is protein. Right? What's the percentage of protein in the feed? Mm. It's usually it's usually in the form of soybeans mm -hmm. or peas or some sort of bean or canola. And so essentially you have these you have these birds that are eating protein and they gain weight quickly yeah. when they're eating this protein. And I've noticed that when you have if you're raising birds for meat, yep. like you're just gonna eat these birds the the protein is higher because you want these birds to gain weight as quickly as you can right. so that you can process them for meat. Mm -hmm. If you have a chicken and you want to get eggs, then what you essentially do is you raise this bird from a chick, giving it high protein. So typically it's 20% protein when it's a chick until about when it's an adult at, at around five to six months of age. Then it begins to lay eggs and you give it a layer ration, which has about 16 to 17% protein. So the protein actually de drops, and uh, and the the chicken doesn't really need that extra protein anymore because it's not it's not growing anymore. It's not gaining weight. It's simply um, maintaining and laying eggs. And so you don't. It doesn't need a lot of protein to do that. So when I think of protein, I think the more protein you get, the more protein you give your animals, the faster they're going to gain weight. So generally, do those birds, are they active? That depends on their living situation, right? So um, if you have, uh, like, like with my chickens, I have large chicken runs where they can run around, jump, fly. Um, if you have, um, you know, like a bird that can run around it's going to be burning calories, right? So it's going to be eating more um, in order to gain weight. So the less active your bird is, such as in, unfortunately, certain farms where they cage animals in battery-style cages, uh, these, these animals, 
you could argue, are eating the least amount of food simply because they're not burning any of those calories. They're just sitting there gaining weight. So that, that protein is just going straight into weight gain. Gotcha. So a lot of you guys are pro- out there thinking, uh, wait, PBR, plant-based riot, and we're talking about raising animals. Mike, this was quite the experience for you. You had you ha- you ha- you raised you were raising a, a couple hundred chickens. How many chickens did I had you about have? About a hundred chickens. And just recently, you had you're you're cutting back and at your market. Are you even selling chicken eggs anymore? You're, you're, I'm not. No. This is, I do have this is recent, I do right? have a very small flock of chickens now, just for my own family. How many consume. people can say that? Right. Eat stuff. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Uh, but so you're very you you. You kind of had a whole farm, and you're kind of you're leaning more towards the vegetables as it's you said more profitable and you, you less work. less input time. That's great. That's right. Yeah, it's it's actually very difficult to make a living selling chicken eggs or chicken. Or it seems like meat. chicken. What's hotter than plants right now is these. Everybody's got these little chicken farms at their house. Every a lot of my friends and I have these little coops and stuff, and they got all these fun, beautiful, colorful eggs and. You know, it's, stuff, if it's just for your own personal use, right? I would say it's actually pretty great. Okay. Simply because you know, it's a a small flock of chickens is a great garbage disposal. You never have to throw away any food. That's awesome. They they'll eat anything that you would throw away, uh, and turn that into compost for your garden. You know, and um, they they tend to be relatively quiet. They um, they can produce really delicious eggs. If you, you know, give them a diversity of plants and vegetables, fruit, um, and so the, the the kinds of eggs that you might get at the supermarket, you might notice how they're they're kind of a pale yellow color. I don't notice that because I don't eat eggs. But okay, well, because I, soy, I heard I heard earlier that the uh, same amount of soy is equal to uh, the, the protein wise is to eating your your, yeah, the, your morning egg so isoleucine even leucine even leucine is another big one um, sure valine as well very very high levels sorry I'm just, I'm just giving you a hard time soy. <laughs> so what he's saying is you need to get a coop of about 100 soy blocks birds. of soy yeah soy birds yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow well yeah sorry no I'm, I don't mean to you know, I, I don't want to shame di- in that. I don't want to digress, but you said something that really caught my interest when you were you were talking about how you feed your chickens. And I don't I don't want to go into a long winded conversation about this, but you had said that you feed them a variety of plants and fruit. And, <laughs> and how, how does that compare to the shit that they're feeding these birds? In like it's like night and day, or okay. even people. Yikes! Right, your your birds probably eat better than a lot of people these days. Oh yeah, yeah. A variety, variety of leaf. You guys just told me that this is the, this is the secret to longevity, right? The variety of leafy greens, fruits and vegetables. You right. get all your protein and like, so you probably have some pretty healthy birds. Practically everything that I grow on my f- small farm, which is quite small, um, goes to the birds in some variation. And so, you know, like I grow quite a few papayas, and you know, um, after I eat most of the papaya, the the peels, which still contain a good amount of papaya fruit on there, go straight to the chickens, and they will love it. They'll eat the skin and as much fruit as they can get. A chicken um, just relishes anything that a person would eat, and they they are connoisseurs of fruit and vegetables. Wow. Okay. So if I'm they reincarnated, love, I want to come here and live here. With <laughs> okay. I, you know, honestly. Um, I can say that chickens love kale and broccoli. That's one of their favorite things to eat, and and you can even test this out. You know, put put um, put some lettuce on the ground, and then a few feet away, put kale or collard greens. Wait, are you is, uh, are you putting a like a is this a blind taste test? How do you get the little? How do you get a cover over their eyes? Are you doing a blind taste test or not? <laughs> they have to see it to know oh, okay. what it is. Right. But. The, a chicken somehow they know they recognize broccoli and kale and they will go they will make a beeline for it. I've witnessed this. It's like a, yeah. a school of piranhas attacking like a wounded little guppy. Like I, <laughs> I, I, I've watched this happen. It, they're ferocious animals when a piece of kale gets yeah. placed on the ground. Well, they have great instincts for, <laughs> for eating some of the most nutrient dense vegetables. Right? Okay, they, they seem to know okay. which ones will nourish them more. Well, this is good because. Um, my children don't really know 
what's going to nourish them more. So, so uh-huh. this is a great parlay into uh, after doing this with your families, what is the best way to get children? We have families, right? What is the best way to you have you're a growing family? If it's you, growing. December, I just heard, right? Number three is coming. Yeah, I don't want to talk about that right now. <laughs> All right, so what are you going to... Emotionally ready for this. <laughs> Good luck. A few more months left. Yeah. So, so what are we doing? What can we do uh, if we're transitioning ourselves and we're going to imp- implement this at home so we're, everybody is on the same bandwagon of eating more plants? If you're just going to start there, you're just eating more plants, not becoming vegetarian, not becoming vegan, not becoming plant-based, not becoming anything. I'm just going to incorporate plants more in my life. How can I get my kids to eat it? How can I get them off of corn dogs and macaroni and tater tots? Like, What's that move like? So if your chickens can do it so good, this has got to be doable at the house. Repetition. You need to provide food repetitively so that something unfamiliar becomes familiar in both shape, color, texture, taste. Right? Um, you know, if, if you know... My, whether they like it or not. Whether they like it or not, right? So, you know, I, I saw some studies on um, children, especially like over in England, where like they have a horrible food system right now like they're you know everyone's living off of fish and chips uh you know the diet over there's really bad um i have a feeling this is not going to go over great in the united kingdom <laughs> this podcast but so <laughs> hopefully, hopefully that changes. Um, well they have wonderful accents i love their accents mm, so. that's true. um but they encourage their children that are trying to you know parents that are trying to get their children to adopt a, a healthier lifestyle they encourage them to play with their food you know, where most parents are like, ah, don't play with your food. Stop that. Over there, they're saying, no, play with it. Become familiar with it. You know, understand how it feels. Understand its texture. Understand when you cook it, it changes the texture. And then by mm. repeating, you know, um, those type of meals over and over again, they're noticing that the children are like, oh, okay, I recognize this. This is not something foreign to me anymore. Therefore, I'm going to eat it. And that's working. It's working. That's cool. Yeah, so it, the kids are starting to adopt it. So I think the more you can connect kids to where vegetables are coming from, yeah. the more familiar they will be yeah. with it. So, you know, starting a vegetable garden, just some, something as simple as growing... With the kids and get the kids get involved. Get the kids involved with growing kale and broccoli. Let them see it developing over time. Let them be involved with nourishing the plant and so that they they feel emotionally attached to this plant because they've been... They've been cooperating with you. They've been helping to, to grow this plant. And then when it's time to harvest uh, a few leaves of kale every few days, um, the, your kids will know not only where it came from, but they'll, they'll, they'll realize that this kale, it, it's something that came about from their labor, from yeah, their work. They saw it. And so throwing... Little to big, yeah. You know, to, to, to throw something like that away is, in, in a sense, is kind of like to throw away your own self. Yeah. You know, so I think the more you can connect yourself to food and bring it closer to you, the more you will want to save it and consume it as much as you can. Let's go. Cool. We, we, we got to put up a picture. We had uh, Brian's kids and my kids were, were harvesting for your market uh, last week. And they're all over there picking the purse lane, and they're cool. all they're all trying it, right? They're picking it, and they're like, they're trying, they're yes. throwing away, they're t- eating a bite of it, and they're they're taking the the uh, the net pots out, and they're taking the the rock wools out, and, and putting the the raw organic in here, and putting the net pots in here, and cleaning, and it, it was cool. cool. They're yeah. filling up the big bins, and I just want to note that you know the entire time Dan was sitting down. <laughs> sipping on the lemonade while it was like 110 it's degrees free labor. Out. And he's Tying like, he's like, Hey, what's taking so long? <laughs> the, now this is following the text message he sent me that said, Brian, I have 600 plants that need to be harvested. Can you come over? Bring a sharp knife. Yeah. So I'm like, I, I better bring the kids, <laughs> um, you know, but we're getting the hang of this, you know, really quick, Mike, I, I want to touch on something that you had just mentioned about connecting the kids with the labor, right? Connecting them with the, the, you know, growing their own plants and taking ownership and seeing, you know, from seed to plant. Right. I also think it's important that our kids know the darker side of food production and they're introduced, you know, however you want to do it. They need to know what the food industry is doing. But how do you do that with your kids? Um, Have you started that yet? I have. I've I've started kind of um, slowly introducing what a factory farm is okay. and how the animals are raised 
and how they are treated and you know the the chemical agents that are given to these animals to make them grow faster and, and also not get sick because they're surrounded by hundreds of other animals where you know as we talked about in the calcium episode there's communicable diseases right the, the cows get cancer they get pink eye they get colds they get infections right and the way they take care of that and they don't you know hurt their investment is they just load them up with antibiotics and all these other things to keep them as healthy as they can before slaughter so i have started introducing that to my kids because i think it would be a tremendous injustice on my behalf if i did not tell them truthfully where you know a cheeseburger comes from um i'm essentially lying to them right i'm i'm i am further pulling the wool over their eyes sure. and they need to be aware of that right um you know, when we see meat, or we see dairy, you know, products, or we see cheese, we see it wrapped up and it's packaged very pretty, pretty, right? It looks good. It looks, you know, the, the fleshy pink color of the meat looks fresh. Um, Which is added in. But if, you know, but most states, it's highly, highly illegal, like punishable by these states. If you were to bring a camera or a video camera anywhere near a slaughterhouse, mm -hmm. because that type of that type of imagery getting out into the mainstream would destroy their business. Right. So that's why if you go to, you know, a, a slaughterhouse or anywhere near it, it, it looks like a prison. Right? It's like a, like an institution with security cameras and security guards and gates. And, you know, if what they're creating is so healthy and so good for us then why be open so about secretive it. about yeah, where be, it's coming be, from be candid about it don't be ashamed of what you're doing open right. open it up to the public right back in my you know back in chicago where i'm from if i wanted to go to the jelly belly factory i could go to the jelly belly factory and they could show me how the jelly beans are made they're not hiding anything right right if i wanted to go to you know one of these slaughterhouses and say hey i got a group full of kids here right <laughs> we want to come here on our on our um field trip can you let us in uh -huh. we'd probably be shot on sight <laughs> so um so i i think yeah you know there's a lot of emotional baggage that comes with eating meat and i think that you know having the luxury to go to the store and buy prepackaged meat allows you to circumvent that that trauma yeah. that, that every farmer goes through yeah. when they process and kill an animal yeah you know so it's something that um, it's something that I think anyone who chooses to eat meat should insist on exposing themselves to, so that they understand um, exactly what what is going into this process. Yeah. And you know, if it, they don't, their argument holds no water. Right. right. Their their argument against not eating it holds no water. The least a person can do is to is to have some respect for an animal. Yep and to actually be there um, to witness what they're eating. Right. So I then, agree. so, okay, then I get that. And if I had the time, I would go and do that. But I just, I ignore it. I eat it. It tastes good. Like, this is how it's perceived. So then, uh, now I, I have to think about this part, too. What are the side effects of eating meat-based protein? Like, how, like just the pro, what if... Are there side effects from eating the meat-based protein? Or is it just side effects from eating eat meat in general? Because we have to get the meat protein. We have to eat the meat itself. Does that make sense? I know we kind of... Have, did we talk about that a little bit? Or is that... So, yeah, is there I mean, anything particular you there? You know, I, I'm going to refer to this question as, you know, the usual suspects. You know, I, whenever, we, whenever we talk about, you know, meat being a source of nutrients, right? We always have to consider what science is showing us currently, right? And we've talked about that in the calcium episode, you know, about these chemical agents that are in the meat, right? So, you know, again, if you're getting your protein from an animal, yes, you obtain more of it through absorption, right? Through digestion and absor absorption, you get more of it, okay? But you're getting all those harmful 
side effects from and it, right? Hit me on a couple of those harmful side effects. So, like we were talking before, you know, you have, you know, um, like the um, uh, the growth factors that they give those animals, right? Um, the bovine growth factor, and we know that um, that particular growth factor that they give the cows to help them grow is inactive in our body, but that induces higher levels of the IGF-1, right? Oh, right. And IGF-1 is, is start, we're starting to see the research that it's associated with, you know, sensitive tissues to IGF-1, like breast cancer, um, ovarian cancer, um, prostate cancer. So, you know, when I, when I talk to people about meat consumption, I always tell them that when, when, you, when you buy this product, regardless of how good it tastes or how, how good it looks, it has a lot of skeletons in its closet. Oh, I say it, I say it again. You've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. You have to be ready to accept those skeletons and what they're going to do to you over the course of your life, right? And, and, and the more this topic comes up and the more research that's being conducted on it, the, the more we're realizing about it, right? Yeah, I barely know that stuff. Right, so you know, and we were looking at you're looking at plants, as Mike was saying. Mike, you could tell us about the advantageous chemicals in plants. Sure. Right. So not only are you capable of getting the same amino acids, right, um, the same essential, non-essential amino acids, right, but you're getting all these other wonderful things in plants that are beneficial for health. That's right. You know, like. Uh one of my favorite um, things that I like to tell my customers at the farmer's market is glucosinolates. Those are spicy sugars okay. that are in certain plants. Right? So, you know, if you've ever heard of the cruciferous vegetables, those are... Uh, what is a cruciferous vegetable? So it's generally in the Brassicaceae family. <laughs> okay. So, so I go deeper. What is the Brassicaceae family? That's my favorite character from the Harry Potter Harry oh, Potter books. So. Yeah, I love that guy. Brassicus Cafe. Yeah, well, he's a bad so guy, right? Brassicas. Uh, so brassicas generally are things like broccoli, uh, kale, cabbage, mustard. Um, you know, watercress is even related. It, I I I believe it's also in the brassica family. Um, mustard. Um, sidebar: Are we going to start planting mustard? Is that happening next week? Oh yeah, that's happening. The bed? Spicy mustard. You heard this, Brad? We're gonna, he wants. To, we're going to start doing spicy mustard in the bed. Mm. So it's good. I don't know if I have. I ever had. I don't think I've ever. You had. have not had it, and wow. it's 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 kind of like wasabi. I don't. There's think another I've, one in the brassica family. I want wasabi. Wow. All yeah, right. So, I'm in. I like the spice, anyways. So what's cool? Oh, rat, I can't forget radish, right? So, um, all the all the brassica plants, um, some are spicier than others, but that spiciness that you get you know it, um, even if you had like broccoli sprouts you'll get a bit of heat from that if you eat a mature broccoli you won't get you won't taste that heat as much but you know have a radish and you'll see how spicy that yes, is I love radish right so that's glucosinolate that is a spicy sugar that contains sulfur and that's what gives it that heat and you're telling this to, to your customers that come into the farm? Yeah. You're like giving these uh, health lessons to, so to these if customers, you, right? If you're getting these spicy sugars in, their, in your diet, there is research showing how that helps to terminate cancer cells. Yeah, sulfur and cancer are oil You've heard and of water. This? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Whoa. Yeah, there's, there's tons of, of plants that contain these glucosinolates. You can almost think of it as like a biofumigant, right? So... In your body, it has these this powerful ability to clean, to cleanse your system. One one plant that comes to mind is moringa. Moringa. A lot of people talk about moringa and how how beneficial that is. That's loaded with glucosinolate. Really. And when I think of you know when I think of um, the That's spicy a leaf, a tree leaf, right? Is that what that is? Moringa. It's a tree and you that has edible leaves and stems and flowers. Generally, the above portion of the tree is what's consumed. The root is like the spiciest horseradish that you'll ever the spiciest encounter. In town. Spiciest and in I would town. I would not encourage anyone to really? eat the root because it is that hot. I oh, mean we need it's to like make hot sauce out of this. It it's deadly heat. Whoa. Yeah. I mean if you ever if you ever dig around a moringa tree, you start to you start to erupt like 
super hot sugars within the root system, and they and they're, they start to spew into the air, and you can smell wow. the spicy root. What's well, something that that's something that gophers steer clear oh. of. Oh, I they bet. will not be chomping on that root. <laughs> So what's another? What's, shoot me a, a couple other plants that are high in this. Uh, what I'm getting at is, are there other plants out there that are uh, anti-cancer plants? Well, you know, I would say any anything green is going to have vitamin C in it, right? All all vegetables, especially leafy green vegetables, are going to have a lot of vitamin C, and vitamin C is a great way to boost your immune system, right? So, it's an antioxidant. Why is it an antioxidant? Because it helps to counter the negative effects of oxidation in your body. So free radical production. That's so what that it is. It neutralizes free radicals. Yep. Wow. Right. You know, um, I, I read this article the other day, and, I, and I, I just need to chime in. It was published by ConAg, um, which uh, is some sort of organization associated with the Cattlemen Association, and their rebuttal to Consume, this is published work. Their rebuttal to a vegetarian diet is that their studies show that a plant-based diet in an effort to try to obtain as much complete protein values as you would get from animals results in excessive caloric intake and weight gain. So essentially what they're saying is if you eat more plants, which is a beautiful fucking thing (laughs) everything you just said there's nothing wrong with eating calorically dense or or plants that are not calorically dense right there's nothing wrong with eating more of them and obtaining those all those things you just said all those beneficial um effects that you get from eating plants and their only leg to stand on is okay ignore everything else that's negatively associated with with meat consumption but if you if you try to obtain the same amount of protein from plants you're going to have to eat more with more of them and there's nothing wrong with that eat as many as you can right you'll get all day you'll get all this good fiber yes right wow very good um okay yeah you know like i always say if you don't if you don't eat enough fiber you're gonna have to use more fiber in the bathroom aka toilet paper (laughs) <laughs> we we call fiber nature mother's nature's broomstick. So they, yeah. they'll clean you out. They'll clean you out. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so a couple of takeaways where we're back to the children, familiarizing them, yep. starting the vegetable garden with them, taking ownership in their food and educating them on where your food came from, where does meat food come from, where do plants food plant food comes from. Got it. So these are these are all great steps you know, just I, circling back I on that. I want to add into like cooking. You know, like there's there's Like take Brussels sprouts, for example. You know, oftentimes people think of Brussels sprouts as, oh, it's so gross. You know, like if you boil it, um, good luck getting your kids to eat that. But guess what? Bake the Brussels sprouts in your oven, drizzle it with some olive oil, salt, and pepper, and then bake it until it's a little bit caramelized. Not too much. Not too much. (laughs) But Because why? Why is that? We don't want to develop those glycotoxins right okay so within reason (laughs) yeah but oh my goodness talk about the most orgasmic brussels sprout you could ever have you can do this with broccoli you can do this with kale i mean just a simple you know drizzling of olive oil salt pepper bake it how long are you baking for what just toasting it or what yeah you're just you know you're baking it for maybe you know like at at, uh let's say 350 for 15 minutes minutes? 15 20 minutes until wow. it's got just a little bit of caramelization on mm. it, and so it's sweet. I mean, I could, I could eat so much broccoli, so much baked broccoli that way. I mean, I, if if I was I was if I was gonna have like, you know, quail and baked broccoli, it would be three fourths of the plate broccoli, and one quarter quail. You know, and the quail like, would be on the plate eating the broccoli with you. Right? <laughs> He'd be your your dinner guest, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, there's just something so great about, you know, baked broccoli and baked Brussels sprouts. And my kids love it. They can't get enough of it. I mean, we're, we're like, we're, we're fighting over it, over what's left over. Like those chickens. Yeah. The, mm-hmm. it's, it's the tastiest you could ever well, make it. A lot of people say that eating plants 
is expensive. Or I'm going to Whole Foods. Or I'm going to farmers markets. Or that I can't afford to eat like that. So, hmm. is that is is plant protein more expensive or less expensive than eating meat protein? Like, what do you guys? How does that come? You guys have had to deal with these conversations. How do you get? How I mean, I'm introducing ecologically meat speaking. I don't. I would say it's kind of pocket. impossible. It's impossible, in my view, for uh, plants to be more expensive than meat, simply because in order to grow animals, you have to feed them vegetables, right? So you have to sell that meat for more than what it costs you to feed those vegetables to the animal. So I mean, if I'm going, if, if I'm, you're just going to eat the vegetable right. versus the versus the meat, it sh- it should environmentally speaking be vastly cheaper to eat the plants and haven't you guys had to deal with this question of like people going to the grocery store and trying to trying to eat solely plants because we we have like you guys said to get the same amount of protein we got to eat a little bit more plants is this is that a more expensive and the other side of that is going out to restaurants that are you know that are basically plant-based restaurants you know when when you talk about beans for example those are considered to be very low value ag crops um they're dirt cheap um so, you know, getting your protein from beans is in ex- it's extremely cheap. However, when you talk about nuts, those tend to be on the higher end. So those those are kind of like the bourgeois crops. Those are those are not cheap. And so, you know, not to say that um, you should uh, avoid the nuts and get the beans, but um, you know, you don't have to have. Uh, a whole bag of nuts every day. So what and you're saying you wouldn't is, want to anyway is run headfirst into a, some nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Don't avoid them, but just sprint towards a sack of nuts. They're expensive. <laughs> they are expensive. All right, I'm sold. <laughs> but wow. you know what's funny is like California grows the world's um, majority of almonds, right? We're the number one producer of almonds in the world, and yet something like 80% of the almonds we grow is exported to Europe and China. So it's like, to me, uh, if we really wanted almonds to be, you know, a plentiful and affordable source of protein for Californians, there shouldn't be no problem with that. We, we're certainly growing more than any Californian could eat. It's just not as We've profitable got, keeping it here. It isn't, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's so a shame. what about like when people say to you, uh, it costs so much money to go to the farmer's market or go to the Whole Foods or maybe we could start our own garden. One thing would be start your own garden. Yes. Yeah, so but also, what do you say to like when people go out? So how I try to bypass that question is... Um, B-U-Y or B-Y pass? Um, that question. Oh, I don't know. That was, that was I, clever. I saw where you, I saw where you went with that. Okay. Um, so how I get past that question, especially when I'm consulting with people, is I tell them that you know, you're making, you're trying to make an investment in yourself. And by doing so, you're going to have to make sacrifices. If, you know, going to Whole Foods or, um, I, I do want, you know, Whole Foods, send us a check. If going Amazon. to, going to one of these like boutique health food stores, right, we'll, do, we'll go that way. Farmer's markets. Farmer's markets. Um, if that's what it takes to motivate you to, adopt a healthier lifestyle then essentially you're you're investing in yourself right you're paying forward into your own health and hopefully by you know making this conversion and you know um disciplining yourself to to budget your money for your own health right don't give it to the credit card companies don't give it to the car company don't give it to the insurance company keep it and invested in your own life in your own lifespan um, this should be a non-issue because by doing so, you're paying forward and you're completely setting yourself up so you will not have to get on medications, go see doctors all the time, you know, um, pay for dialysis, pay for dialysis, you know, get different treatments, you know, um, right yeah, here, doctor, like, you know, that like, like heart stints and heart surgery, that's probably Expensive, right? Is that more than? Well, do you think that's more expensive than eating vegetables? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, sure. It sounds expensive. It sure it's, it's, it sounds painful. It's taxing not only on you and your health and your emotions, but it's also taxing on your family and everything they have to go through when 
a loved one gets sick, right? It doesn't just affect you, it trickles down and affects everyone that is involved in your life. So, yes, I've noticed that eating plants can be more expensive. Um, but to me and to my family, it's worth every dollar that we pay for it. And we, we adjust and budget our money so that that is in the forefront of our purchases. And you I, value your health. I, I haven't been sick in 20 years. I, I never That's sick. Awesome. You know, I mean, I get the, the cold, common cold occasionally, but um, I, I've never stayed in a hospital. I've never had to see a doctor because of an illness. You know, as I said, I'm a I'm a 23 year plant slayer, man. I'm I, I've adopted this shit. I have noticed after I stopped eating the meat, yeah. I went I went even not even getting the flu, runny nose. It was about a year and a half before I got sick from the kids bringing something home. I had a I ended up getting some sort of runny nose deal, but I was I was um I was just totally see. I would say that's that's because you probably get a lot more vitamin C in your diet. Uh, yeah, and. You know, I, I worked with a dear friend of mine back in Chicago. I'm not going to say his last name. I'm just going to call him Flatbread. He knows who he is. Flatbread. Yeah. Um, he was diagnosed with diabetes. Um, pretty severe. Uh, very high fasting glucose levels. Very high HbA1c. He was developing gout. Um, you know, kidney issues. Um, he had come to me, and we. Well, he wasn't plant based. Was he, he wasn't. He was a metasaurus, and his family was a metas. They were metasauruses as well. Um, so he came to me, and we we sat and had a heart to heart one night. And basically, you know, I had given him and his wife uh, a lot of advice and a lot of suggestions on on how to start eating. Um, you know, because the last thing you want to do is have to rely on insulin because your your beta cells have been destroyed because. You know, you're insulin resistant, the, the skeletal muscle is insulin resistant, and you know, you just have insulin spewing out of the pancreas all the time. Um, so, we changed his diet, and literally in three weeks, he went to go get a blood test. And all the, all the bio, the biochemistry, or I'm sorry, the, the markers in the blood that indicate that something's not right, they all plummeted. Um, all of his like TNF alpha markers, which is like an inflammation markers, IL six and IL one, which are inflammation markers, triacylglycerols plummeted. Um, you know, all of his HDL, LDL, VLDL, all of those levels um, corrected, and uh, he just started losing weight. And then after this, he got off of his metformin, which is a, a common, you know, how long did that take? It, it was literally a month. So, really? So what? What? What I'm trying to say is, it's reversible. That's the power of plants, right? I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, the protein that this country chooses to eat, right? We select this protein because it's readily available, it's inexpensive, it's everywhere, right? You go out with your friends and you have a night out on the town, and then you get hungry at one in the morning. There's no farmer's market that's open that you can drive through and pick up a, a you know a, a head of bib, le uh, bib lettuce, right? Sure. You have to go to one of the, you know, one of the fast food chains that are conveniently open late at night because they know that there's a lot of money to be made, right? Um, so yeah, so he, you know, he really that's great turned his life. How's around. he doing now? What's what's it, how many years has that uh, been? Or I don't want to talk about it. Great. Yeah, he he, I think he went back to the dark side. But. Okay. Yeah. Good so one. if you have if you have chronic illness, and then you adopt a vegan or plant based diet, you yeah. can rather quickly reverse the disease. We see that two to three weeks, things start getting better. That's crazy. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how long you've been eating meat or how long you've been eating unhealthily. No, you could start eating. Start so the takeaway here is start eating your greens. Start start eating your greens. Start start trying to find. Um, more diverse sources of protein. And you don't need as much protein as the damn food industry is telling you you need. You do not need protein in every meal that you have. You do not need a high level of protein in every meal that you have, especially if you're sitting at a desk and you're inactive and you're not doing anything. That protein is not providing you any more energy than 5 to 7%. That's it. That's crazy. That's it. To your point, as you said, our world is set up to be eating meat protein, not plant protein. Do you guys see this changing in the future? 
I think Mike could answer that since yeah. he's kind of in the trenches at the farmer's market. You know, I think that um, the more that people start to raise their own fruits and vegetables or and raise their own animals, the more that uh, plants and, you know, fruits and vegetables basically take the main scene. Um, you know, um, my using myself as an example, I, I raise chickens and... Um, that is the smallest part of my operation. The the the, the most of um, what I do is growing plants, and that's the easiest thing. That's the cheapest thing for me, um, and it provides the greatest return. And so, um, in the future, I think that um, there's just going to be a continuation of more um, plant-based diets, basically because. Um, you'll have more farmers adopting a, a, a sustainable economic and agricultural model that is in favor of plants simply because it's it works much better wow all right so brian yes what can i do today to start eating more plant-based protein what is my first step diversification as we mentioned earlier, you, you've got to start diversifying your sources of protein, right? Yes, we all know that if you get a cheeseburger with mayonnaise on it and cheese on it, um, you're getting a tremendous amount of protein, right? Um, by choosing to obtain a healthier source of protein, it's going to take some conditioning and some some effort on reinventing yourself and you know I think that's where a lot of this um, paleo diet is starting to gain a, a lot of momentum right because people can they can get on the paleo diet and stick to the paleo diet right because you get to eat all the things that you normally eat right you get to eat high levels of protein high levels of fat you, you can you can stick to that diet very easily but you know Trying to retrain your palate and retrain the way you feed yourself, and even rebudget your money so that you can purchase right, as a lifestyle plants right? that are perishable. Right, you can't throw a plant in the freezer and be like, "Oh, I'm going to microwave that." Right, right, when I come home, you have to realize that all these all these steps have to occur. Right, and yes, it's a little bit of work, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. Right, everything we want to do to better ourselves takes work. Right. And eventually that work turns into habit. And then that habit, you don't even realize you're doing it anymore because it's it's become your lifestyle, right? Educate yourself, as I say at the end of every episode. Educate yourself. Diversify yourself. Read and learn that what the food industry is telling us is not the truth. It's the truth that they want to sell you and that you buy. So if you want to start making these changes, that's what I recommend you do. I recommend you start diversifying your palate, diversifying what plants you buy and you put in your refrigerator, diversifying how you cook them. You know, when you said paleo, if I was a paleolithic human, right, and I'm running, I'm running through forests, I'm searching for food, right? What, what's probably the, the majority of what I'm going to find? It's going to be, you know, some, there's some berries over here. Yeah. There's uh, there's some root vegetables growing but beside this river. Yeah. And then if I'm lucky, I might find some river rat that I can throw a stick at. <laughs> you know, like like if I if I'm if I'm the true paleo, you know, hunter, yeah. gatherer, yep. I'm going to be doing mostly gathering simply because that's the easiest and thing to do. And trying not to be hunted. <laughs> yeah, trying not to be hunted by the the feral cats. Yeah. Large cats. But like, you know, if I could if I was lucky, fortunate enough to actually get some meat, yeah, it would be hard one. Yeah, I mean because it is tough. It is so difficult to hunt an animal. Yeah, and before eat the it. invention of the gun, right? How, how are you? How I are mean, you you're tackling burning, a gazelle you're, you're and taking that thing down? Tremendous <laughs> amount of yeah, you're burning a tremendous amount of calories trying to run yeah. down an animal. Yeah, and um, you know it's it's not easy to do that. And animals are not nearly as plentiful as plants are. Yeah. Right, you're surrounded by food, and that's what you're gonna get 
first and foremost because that's the easiest to get. Nice. Well, you know. I know we're kind of coming to a close here. Do you guys have anything, any big takeaways that you guys have maybe learned through this conversation that you want to bring up again? Just a, a quick summarize on any anything pertaining to plant based proteins. I, I just want to I just want to close out by reiterating that the source of protein does not matter. It is the intentional approach of obtaining all the amino acids. Twenty amino acids, essential non-essential you have to get all of them and they can all come from plants i've i've read you the sources of some of these you know um really important essential amino acids that the body doesn't body doesn't create um it's 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 there um so it doesn't don't let people tell you that animal protein is better than plant protein animal protein is more complete with that complete protein, you're getting a lot of skeletons in the closet. Plant proteins, they're not as complete. You have to eat more of them, but you can do it and you can maintain a healthy lifestyle. You can grow muscle. You can be active. You can be just as strong as any meat eater. Mike, do you have anything from the garden? You know, um, I would say that uh, the leafy veggies you can grow uh, are perhaps the most plentiful and abundant thing, vegetables you can try. So, you know, if you're on if you're on a small scale, if you have limited space, the greatest way that you can increase your health is to grow leafy greens. They're the fastest growing. They'll give you some of the most medicinal effects, and they can absolutely help to increase your protein. Well, he didn't get the term t- tenderest in town. By growing chickens, guys. Spiciest in town. Spicy. I like that. I want to try the root ball. Watch out for the root balls on the moringa tree, right? Okay. Coming at you. Sorry, one more time here. Three. Coming at you from Sierra Madre, we are Plant Based Riot. What are you going to do with those extra disease free years? Thanks again, Plant Eaters. Tune in next week to hear more Garden Gab and Eat Well. I'm Brian, 23 year plant slayer. I'm Mike, the plant scientist. And I'm Dan that eats plants. All right. We are Plant Based Riot. <laughs>